Hi, I'm Damon Galgut. It's my great pleasure to be speaking today to Nsika Korta, who is the winner of the Commonwealth Short Story Competition for 2022. How are you, Nsika? I'm, I'm great, Damon. <laughs> uh, nice, to, nice to meet you as well. Yeah. yeah, very good to be speaking, and it's especially good um, to be speaking to somebody else from my part of the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You are currently continuing um, what seems to be a winning streak for African writing. We, I, uh, when I say we, I speak for other African writers. We, we pretty much swept the boards last year and um, here you are adding to that little pile. So um, I wonder if that means something to you, the, the fact that um, so many prizes, literary prizes, recently have gone to African writers. Is that something that gives you an especial pleasure or do you not think of yourself as part of a big pan-African writing body? That's a, it's a bit of a complex question because, uh, you know, as a, as a, you know, a, a hobbyist and a, an amateur, if you had asked me, I would have never considered myself at all part of the, the tradition or the, you know, the, the community of, of African writers. I was just, you know, someone who wrote things. Um, perhaps dilettante is too harsh, but, you know, I was just, you know, laboring alone in my little corner. Um, but, you know, now sort of having won this award, um, I, I do feel honored to be, uh, to be honest, to have, you know, added my little bit to sort of this, this idea, this growing idea or the growing recognition globally of African writing and, you know, African writers and the ideas that we have to share as, you know, on the continent, you know. Okay, you talk about yourself as an amateur. Um, and I see in the biographical note on the Granta website where your story appears that um, mm. you are a chemist by training. Mm. So I'm wondering, um, Firstly, I'll, I'll come back to your self-definition as an amateur because um, I, I think it's an interesting way of seeing yourself, but not necessarily accurate. Um, how did you come to write if, you know, being, being a chemist is your hmm. main uh, vocation? Well, it, it's sort of, it's the seed of it, the seed of uh, a, a desire to write was planted in me in way back in high school. Uh, we, you know, we had... Uh, it's English, um, the, it wasn't literature, it was uh, sort of writing classes in high school. Um, and there was this, well, I mean, I'd always enjoyed creative writing, even from primary school. It was just one of the subjects I enjoyed along with the sciences and all that. Um, but it never sort of, it, 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 it never, it was never like standing head and shoulders above all of the other subjects in, in my mind. I just, it was something I really enjoyed until uh, this one time in high school and we had a, a, an assignment that our teacher, uh, you know, set. And the story was, well, the story was, uh, in, instead of just sort of writing a story based on a theme or based on some plot, the, the only restriction was just the title. The story's title just had to be Heavy Rain. And then whatever theme, whatever plot um, you chose didn't really matter as long as it had, you know, any kind of tenuous link to the title Heavy Rain. And I, I just remember the story I wrote for that when I, um, well, I, I don't know if I can, I won't go into the whole detail of what the story was. Just the, to, to summarize, it was just something I was incredibly proud of, you know, more than anything else I'd ever written, you know, up to that point, even though I'd enjoyed it. It was only at that point where I thought, you know, writing and, you know, the, the act of writing and you know, editing and having a complete story can be, something that was very pleasurable on, in and of itself. Um, so that, that sort of planted a seed in me, this, this idea that I, you know, writing might be something I enjoyed. But even at that point, I was still very, you know, very much science-minded. I was very much technical-minded. I, I still wanted to pursue the science thing in, in university. So in university, I did still stick to the physical sciences, you know, maths and chemistry and all that. 
And, you know, I fell in love with chemistry as well in university. So writing remained something that I, it was just a memory of, of um, you know, sort of high school sweetheart you could think of, you know, something that I'd enjoyed then. And I, I had had this seed of, wow, writing's great. And um, I think it was around when I was doing my postgrad in chemistry, I, I possibly just had a time when I thought to myself, you know, it would have been nice to have been a writer. It would have been nice to start writing and I, it occurred to me at, a, at that point that there wasn't really anything stopping me from just, you know, opening my laptop and writing something. Um, so, you know, with that memory of that story in my mind, I just decided, you know, I may as well start writing, just, just write something. It doesn't really matter if it's good or it's bad. Just if I enjoyed it, then I'll probably enjoy it now. And yeah, since then, basically, I think that was possibly 2018 or 2019. Um, so since then, that's, pretty much what I've been doing. It was just that that hobby of, you know, I just started it as a hobby, you know, based on that that little seed that had been planted. And so that's 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 how I came into writing. I should I should perhaps have um, said, although I expect most viewers uh, or readers will know this, that that you're mm -hmm. from Eswatini, yes, which yes. is a very, very small country adjoining my larger country, yes. um, but you are, as far as I know, the very, very first person even to have been shortlisted from Eswatini, I mean, let alone to have won this competition. I mean, that's, that's a very big achievement. Um, you know, um, to come back to your self-description as um, an amateur, and I, mm. I think elsewhere online, I, um, I see you describe yourself as self-trained. Um, there's a certain irony in this because I guess the concept that one is self-trained or an amateur reflects the fact that so many university uh, universities these days offer creative writing mm. courses um, and that to be a professional writer, maybe one should have gone through one of these courses. But in fact, you know, for most of the writing tradition that exists in the world, there was, there is really still very little training, very little preparation, and your, mm. you know, your your pamphlet from a university course is not going to help you in the end with what is actually a very personal endeavor. So I'm mm. afraid you are now no longer an amateur. What went into your self training? Um, reading, I'm assuming, uh, and um, are there very particular writers who you feel have been influential in shaping the way you write or the way you think about writing? Yeah, I would say possibly, you know, the, the you know, the, the great, um, the great amount of sort of my, my instinctive, like my instinctive taste for what I like and what I don't like, it really was informed by just a lot of reading. You know, I, I, I was a voracious reader when I was younger. You know, that was, you know, one of my, like my main hobbies was, was just reading. And in terms of influences, I think it's it's quite difficult to pinpoint influence because, you know, what what it made the greatest impression on me may not necessarily have been what influenced me the most. You know, it is possible, you know, for me to have read something and it strongly influences my ideas, but I just don't realize it. But I will say that in terms of you know what had the strongest impact on me was you know uh, to a great extent sci-fi writers. So Isaac Asimov um, and, and Arthur C. Clarke. So as, as a child, I was a huge, a huge sci-fi fan. Um, these days, though, I've, I've you know, tended to branch out a little bit more. My sister, she's, um, she's, been, she's really good about, like her, her personal library of books is basically what I, you know, what I <laughs> pick, pick out from. And she's very, um, you know, she's very, focused on African writing. And so as an adult now, that's kind of where my, my, my interest is, is sort of leaned towards. Um, because while I did, and I do really enjoy sci-fi, it has been previously quite, um, uh, what's the word? Like most of the writers are from the West and are male and, you know, so the idea of, you know, African writers and people who are sort of a little bit more like me will live in environments that are like mine, I think that has started to influence the way that I want to write all the stories that I, I want to, to create sort of um, stories that have, that, um, well, you know, stories that sort of look like 
my surroundings and yeah, yeah i don't know if that makes sense yeah. no it does um it's very interesting to me that um that you're interested in sci-fi um because in dealings i've had with younger african writers over the last few years it's been a very common theme and um it's not what you would traditionally expect to emerge um, or, or to be a concern for African writers. So mm -hmm. the creation of this particular story and, and yes. the Earth Bank Deep, was it um, was there anything that shaped this this particular story, which is not a piece of science fiction at all? No, not at all, yeah. This particular story, I think. It, it, Based like when I when I had that premise, it sort of just popped into my mind. So I can't I can't have a I can't take credit for sort of you know shaping the premise in any way. It sort of popped into my mind mostly fully formed, and then it was just a case of exploring all of the 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 consequences of you know someone without empathy in that time frame in that environment. But when it came to um, I don't know how to put it, perhaps the language or the 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 yeah, but like the, the sort of the, the writing style, I could say maybe. When it came to that, I was very much trying to imitate um, the style of um, Ngugi Wationgo, who's, I think a lot of his set works were, we studied them in English literature in high school. And at the time, to be honest, it I didn't, I couldn't quite like get, dig into it in a way that I think was, you know, um, effective enough to get high marks. But I think that style sort of, you know, still stuck into my mind. Like it was a very specific and, and also, you know, Chinua Achebe, like those, a very specific voice, which I, I really felt like was appropriate for this kind of story. So I think those, that kind of writing, that, that kind of voice of like rhetorical questions, like, um, you know, um, and how could, yeah, it's, okay, I, I can't think of an example now, but a, a sort of question, an explanatory, sort of thing but it's asked as a rhetorical question in a way when you're so, when you're sort of like oh how could anyone do this or um would it not be better to do this i don't know if that that makes sense but that kind of of way of of narrating the story i think i, I was really trying to capture that and, and sort of use it for this particular story rather than a more um sort of uh, analytical uh, narr narrator sort of, I don't know, if, yeah. Hmm. Um, perhaps for those people who haven't read your story yet, it would be useful to get a little flavor of it. I've got a few questions I'd like to put to you about the story, but um, if you wouldn't mind reading a little extract for us, that might uh, set the stage for our ongoing conversation. No problem. Okay, let me just uh, get an excerpt here. Sure. Cool morning air rushed in through and out of the hunter's lungs. The still dew damp grass wet his legs to the thighs as he charged through it. His prey, Anyala, was fleeing right into the path of the rest of the party, downwind and invisible in the tall grass. As the panicked animal fled, the hunter watched a single spear arc gracefully aloft and find its mark in Anyala's flank. The beast continued to run its pace steadily slowing until it fell to the ground. In the excitement of his first real hunt, he was the quickest to reach the downed animal. The young man was surprised to find it was still alive, breathing heavily with a muddy pool of blood already forming. He looked into its bovine eyes filled with exhausted panic or resignation. He wasn't sure, but he was drawn to it, the pain, the suffering. He found his own breathing was harder now than before, and his heart was pounding. He reached for the shaft of the spear buried in bloodied flesh and twisted it gently. Wrapped as the eyes widened and the nyala let out a weak grunt of pain. With his attention completely focused on the wounded animal at his feet, the hunter reached over with his other hand to get a better grip on the spear. He was startled out of his trance by a quick thrust of another spear directly into the Nyala's heart. It stopped moving immediately. He looked up and saw Zungu staring back with a mixture of disapproval and irritation. Zungu scolded him for letting, him, letting the beast suffer, implying that he must not have been ready to join a real hunt. 
The hunter apologized, showing sufficient deference to cover up, he hoped, the enjoyment that must have been plastered all over his face just seconds before. The rest of the party soon joined them, and they set about gutting their kill, removing the offal with sharpened stone knives before mounting the carcass on a long yoke for the trek home. By the time they were done and ready to head back, the sun was approaching zenith, bringing with it the biting heat of summer. The party began the return journey with Zungu leading them in victory song. They left the pile of offal for scavengers to find. In the monotony of the march back, the hunter relived the Nyala's death over and over again in his mind. He could smell its blood whenever the wind blew right, but now that it was meat, it was of little interest to him. The more he thought about it, the more he realized that his fascination came from seeing the essence of life extinguished, the fear and confusion and pain. He had seen death before, during funeral rites and seasons past, but he only now made the connection between the two, life and death, death and dying. He eagerly looked forward to the next hunt. Thank you. That, that <laughs> yeah. I think, sets, sets the stage. I'm intrigued by, well, I'm intrigued by a few things, but, but I was especially intrigued um, as a kickoff question with why you give no name to your central character. He's referred to as the hunter. Mm. Um, was there a very specific reason why you made that choice? Mm, yeah, there was a specific. So with the hunter, um, partly I wanted him to sort of be at least in the reader's mind, sort of separate from the other villagers, you know, they have names and they sort of, so like someone with a name, I think we uh, instinctively, you know, personify them and we give them sort of human characteristics, even if they aren't described. But I think with the hunter, I wanted to have him separate, you know, and have that that drive of his, you know, the hunting drive, the, the desire for, for things to happen sort of thing, like his desires to be at the forefront whenever we, whenever, the reader encounters him, you know, so without sort of uh, turning him into a monster, but also to highlight the fact that he is not the same as the others, you know, he, he, he lacks that empathy, he is driven, he hunts, he, you know, hunts, you know, in the metaphorical sense now. So it was very much a way to highlight how different he is from everyone else in the village. Yes, it very much sets him apart, although, um... It takes a while for this in the unfolding of the story for the reader to become aware of just how different he is. The other, the other um, characters in the story are, are all operating according to the standards of a particular community. Mm -hmm. um, yet the hunter performs certain actions, and 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 the other characters seem to interpret his actions in a generous way, um, even when they realize he's behaved wrongly or badly. Um, they're still generous in the sense that they think his bad behavior is because he's young, or because he's afraid. Yeah. Whereas, in fact, his motivations seem to be something else entirely. Yeah. Um, how do you see his motivations? His motivations, I think, it's with some of the people I've spoken about, you know, about the story, I think they view his motivations as being overtly, uh, inherently violent. Whereas that's that's not necessarily how I see it. I think with the hunter, it's that lack of empathy. I think rather than making him outwardly, you know, violent, I think what it does is it puts violence on the table in terms of when you know seeking what he wants. So for, for everyone else, if they want something, you know, in the world, they wouldn't necessarily, you know, violence would not be an option. Doing violence against someone else would not be an option for them. You know, it would, it, in the best case scenario, it would create severe internal conflict. But in the hunter's case, without that empathy, he is able to just consider violence as just any other thing. And, you know, it's the same as, you know, asking someone to do something or, you know, um, any other course of action. So when it comes to the situation at the end in which he there's a threat to his social standing, and in any other case, someone might go to uh, you know uh, the, the chief and to Zunga and 
and plead with them, you know, to please not 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 reveal this, the situation. Whereas for him, the most logical action is actually to make it so that the two of them can never reveal the secret. And the only way to make it impossible for them to reveal the secret is to do violence. So I think in that situation, violence is, you could think of as the rational action. So I think in situations where a vi violence can bring about his his desires, he's, he's happy to do it, but he doesn't go out and just wantonly, you know, act violently towards others. That that's I think that's how I see the, the hunter. So violence is a means to an end for him and a, a logical way of achieving what he wants. But what he wants is very much um, singular, whereas mm -hmm. everyone else is part of a community. And when I when I read your story um, initially, I wasn't aware that, and perhaps I'm wrong in this, um, but I got the impression from um, other interviews with you that the story is in fact set quite a long time ago, at least in your, in, in your mind, but it could be set now. I mean, it could be part of a traditional rural tribal setup in Africa. Um, you, I mean, it could be playing out in, you know, many, many countries in Africa, um, including South Africa, just away from a sort of um, urban setting, I guess. I mean, am, am I wrong in that? Yeah, I think I, I, my, my intention was definitely uh, to, to, to set it very much in, in the very beginning of sort of the human species, like right at the emergence of Homo sapiens, you know, so that in, in a sense, it would be like the idea of someone like the hunter, you know, with, born without empathy or, you know, and that would be something very, uh, very new um, that communities, you know, the interaction between various communities would be very new. So we wouldn't have things like sort of uh, tribal violence because in a situation where uh, a more modern setting, the idea of, of um, in, in sort of conflict and war and on a larger scale that exists so that the idea that someone might harm someone else in a sort of cold-blooded way is not necessarily unheard of. It's not unknown. So the, the idea was that I wanted to push it, push the setting way back there so that these ideas were, were really, like the idea of someone behaving this way was really something unusual that people wouldn't jump to that, you know, idea like, um, whereas today in that situation, I think we are more aware of that kind of violence, I would say. So that's, yeah, in my mind, that's why the setting is sort of um, uh, very much prehistoric. But in, in a practical sense, yes, it really could be, be quite modern, you know. I mean, that's really interesting because that um, the way you framed it really does throw into very stark relief the actions and the morality or lack of morality attached to those actions. But but you're right, that would probably have got lost in a, more, you know, denser, more modern picture. Your own um, background, are you a, um, a city dweller? Were you, were you raised in the city? Um, have, have you got any sort of rural background at all? I actually don't. Um, no, I was I was raised um, in the capital of Mabane, in sort of in the suburbs. So I've never I never had any real um, uh, you know experience living uh, with rural life, um, except in sort of very brief you know visits with with family kind of thing, um, like with relatives. So in terms of the actual nitty gritties of of uh, rural life that it was I had to sort of make that up from whole cloth in a sense <laughs> yeah well sure um I, I've seen in one particular interview where you um you talk about uh being on your own in nature as being you know conducive to creative thoughts I mean that's something I relate to I mean do you take yourself off on your own to think about ideas mm, I really I, I really love um, you know, hiking and, and cycling. It's just, I think, especially to seeing things from, from high up, I think just from, and seeing, you know, just even the, you know, in the hills outside the city, you know, just hiking into them and, and looking down on, on existence.
I think it's it's such a for me like it just it really helps my mind sort of you know reach out and in a sense you know get I don't know if you've ever felt the sense of you know when you see large collections of even if it's if it's the city and you that you that you're viewing and you just think of like every single one of those people has a story and how how complex every single person is I think getting that sense and and feeling that really helps me in terms of you know letting my mind wander and be like I wonder what what you know the person in that window with the light that just turned on like what what's going on there you know and just sort of that that kind of thing I think it's it's like a helpful device for me to really you know let my mind branch out and and you know seek all of these ideas and sort of interrogate any any and all these little thoughts that pop up and actually the the premise for and the earth then drank deep was one of those thoughts you know that just sort of pops up just randomly you know what if xyz and, and you just grab onto it and you know interrogate it more so i think generating those thoughts and then also being able to grab and interrogate them i think is being out in nature really helps me to do that um, you said you said the idea for the story arrived fully formed. Um, Essentially, the, the whole shape of the story. It, it just um, not not the whole shape of the story. Just just the the premise. So just the idea, like the like what if a serial killer was existed in prehistoric times. So just that idea like popped in, and then as I, as that that thought put, sort of was frozen in my mind, I was like you know, how would everyone else, you know, react to it? Okay, so they don't have law necessarily. So how, did, how does the village deal with, with infractions kind of thing? So it was just that that premise popped in and then it was just questions asking and questions based on that, you know, step by step. And then from there, that's where the story kind of evolved. And did you write it in one sitting? Um, or did, no. it, did it come over a series of uh, engagements? No, no, it's for me, um, it, I've rarely ever written anything more than, you know, a thousand words in one sitting. Um, but I mean, on, you know, so generally my, my routine is that at least a hundred words a day of, of if, it's, if it's a set story that I'm working on, yeah, at least a hundred words a day. But oftentimes it's, it's just unrelated little snippets of writing, just something that it's just written and it's interesting, you know. But when I'm working on a story, um, I try to do yes a minimum of 100 words a day but oftentimes if there is you know if i'm if the ideas are flowing flowing out then i might do you know up to say a thousand words in a sitting but the, i don't think i've ever written much more than that so i think overall this this story would have taken you know probably a few days perhaps like one or two weeks like overall just into just to write the the basic thing and then another few weeks probably editing so the way the story resolves, um, the the decisions he makes to ensure that his, you know, his actions are not, um, uh, his actions do not catch up with him, shall we say, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. in fact committing more actions of the same sort. Yeah. Was that obvious to you from the beginning, or was it something that evolved during the writing? I wrote it quite a while ago, so I can't remember for sure, but I'm pretty sure that was one of the things that evolved because I didn't have an ending when I started. So, no, I think that, 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 I think that evolved as the story went on. I think the only things that I had definitely planned, um, I'd have to pull up the, the little skeleton that I wrote, but I think the only thing that I definitely planned was that he would initially take some action like unusual action and not be discovered or or that you know the fact of that action would be sort of you know be interpreted generously so I think if that was all that I had you know beforehand and then as I was writing at the end I realized okay you know that was the ending you know stopping right there would would be the 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 the, the right stopping point yeah so no that definitely evolved I think um how is your when been received in Eswatini, um, have you been um, celebrated or do you feel it hasn't really registered? I mean, I, I have no sense of mm -hmm. what the reading community might be like there. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's been registered quite well. I mean, 
I think naturally being a small country, it's also a very small, you know, community, uh, you know, writers, but, you know, from, you know, the, the few people that I know, it's been, you know, very well, uh, you know, well received, you know, there's been a few stories in the papers as well. So, you know, I think, I, and I, I hope that, you know, the people who have, who may not have entered the competition or known about the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, I think, you know, who may not necessarily be in the community have also been motivated uh, now to, to, to enter. So hopefully, if not necessarily wind from Swatini later on, you know, in years to come, I hope we'll get a lot more entries at least. Uh, do you, I mean, do you have friends who, who write like you do? I mean, do you feel like you're, you're part of a group who can exchange ideas and um, compare stories or maybe help each mm -hmm. other? Or do you feel very much on your own? Generally, no, I've been, it's just, it's been just me. Like all of my friends are not, they're not hobbyist writers. Um, you know, we sort of interact in other ways. So I have never really joined any kind of writing group or, or writing competition um, until very recently um, when I was in Kigali that I met some writers, some Rwandan writers. And um, so we i have been in correspondence with several of them uh, since then. So I, it's a very, very recent development in terms of you know joining up with a, a writing community and, and is that a, is that a relief i mean do you do you want to be part of such a community or do you feel you need to be isolated to draw on whatever your own inspirations might be i think i'm open to exploring i i because it's just something that had never it never occurred to me um to join a community before because you know, as far as I was concerned, I would just write something and, you know, later reading it would be amusing, you know. Uh, so it never really occurred to me to have like external influences or sort of external connections to my writing. So I think I'm, I'm excited, a little bit nervous as well, because I think the idea of sharing, you know, my writing, it's something I've never done and it is kind of nerve wracking to have someone that you know, someone that you, you know, you're talking to sort of reading and, you know, making comment on the writing. Uh, but I think it's also an important, it's probably an important growth step, you know, to be able to communicate about writing with other writers or with other people in general. Well, an offshoot to that question is, um, do you feel you're writing for a particular audience or are you writing for yourself? No, I think I definitely have always written for myself. Um, also because I didn't really know, I had no way of knowing what an audience would want, you know, whereas I know for a fact what I like and what I don't like. So my writing was always like, was always designed for me to like, for me to enjoy. So I enjoyed the process, but then when it came to uh, editing, for example, you know, what determined whether I thought it was good was just whether I enjoyed it. So I uh, know I've never written for an audience because, I mean, if I tried, I think I'd probably fail because I don't really, I, I, I don't know what other people look for in writing, but I do know what I look for in writing. So I think I'd write for myself and then if other people enjoy it, then that's, that's great as well. You know? So your sense of satisfaction um, from a piece of writing is the sense that you've shaped it the way you want it to be. Mm, yeah, that, that's my great satisfaction actually. And in, in fact, that is the reason, the, the, the main reason that I wanted to submit to the Commonwealth Short Story Prize is because I had this story, you know, that I'd written a while ago and I, I, was, I enjoyed it, but I never properly edited it. So when it came to submission time for the for last year, then I decided, you know, it would be nice to use it as like motivation to, to have the editing. And then at the end of that, you know, when I finished submitting, I'd have a story that I really enjoyed you know, and I'd also have the, the, that experience of editing it. So for me, that was the main motivation. And that was sort of the metric of you know, what I decided, like my metric of success was that I had enjoyed writing it. Yes, I enjoyed reading it. And after editing it, you know, do I, you know, do I like what it, I like, do I like the shape of it? You know, do I enjoy it? And the answers to all of that was yes, when I clicked submit. So I, I felt like I'd gotten, you know, everything I needed from the competition, you know, at that point, you know, and then obviously won the award. And that was incredible. You know. Well, I mean, that changes things, right? Because you have a whole lot more readers now, um, people who are interested in what mm -hmm. you've produced and will produce. <laughs> um, so in those terms, I wonder 
what winning this prize means to you and your sense of the future. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think it changes your writing or your writing habits? And does it change what you plan for yourself writing-wise? Mm. I don't think it changes. I hope it doesn't change necessarily my my writing, uh, well, my sort of my journey in writing or style. But what it does change is my ambition. Definitely, it's my ambition now in in writing is much different than it was before. Because before I really I only just sought to improve and just from my own self assessment, I just wanted to be able to consistently write things that I enjoyed and and write in a way that I enjoyed and you know consistently you know uh, improve. Whereas now I do have that ambition that I do perhaps want to publish some of my writing or, you know, at least spread it to a wider audience, just, you know, out of, for interest sake, just to see, you know, how, how interest be, interested people are. But at the back, you know, on the, at the back of my mind, I, re, I really want to keep that, the focus on, in terms of like my metric of success, to never have it necessarily be what other people think of it, because I think, then in the situation where I put something out and people didn't like it or it, you know, it was even, it was apathy, the reaction was apathy. I think then if my metric of success was how people reacted to my writing, I think that might then, you know, like demotivate me to write. Whereas I think if, as long as I keep the metric of success to be very much internally focused and very much what I think of the writing, then, you know, I, I, that's what I sort of, so my ambition is sort of to publish, but maintain that internal focus in terms of motivation and success kind of thing. Do you have ambitions to write a novel? Yeah, I, I actually, um, I've, I've, in um, 2019 and 2020, I don't know if you've heard of this, this program. It's a, it's a nonprofit uh, organization from the US so they created this this event. It's like a sort of worldwide event, and uh, writers from all over the world, um, sort of non professionals or professional writers, they sort of spend the year sort of planning a novel, and then in the month of November, you write. I think it's a thousand six hundred words a day every day in November for those thirty days, and then at the end, you have sort of a novella kind of length uh, story. So the idea is just for people who have always wanted to write a novel to so like give them that motivation and give them like a real structure that you can just work through to get to their novel. So for people who have not had motivation. So a few years ago, my friend told me about it and I was intrigued by that idea. So at that, until that point, it had never occurred to me to try and write a novel because it just seemed like a, an incredibly just insurmountable thing. Like short stories was just what I did. So I did that, did the National Novel Writing Month thing in 20 like well in two years I can't remember which ones so I have before written a novel so I think I have uh the the sense of um that it's possible but it's very difficult but I would like to you know publish you know write a, a novel that I enjoyed because the two novels that I wrote I didn't I thought they were good stories but I didn't feel like they were great stories I didn't feel about them the way that I feel about and the earth drank deep but I would I really would like to try again to you know write a novel length um story that i feel as strongly positive about as i do about this and the earth drink deep yeah i mean just to be clear i think the short story form is exquisite and people who do it well are um you know practitioners of a craft that's deserving of as much respect as novelists they're, they're just um different things so mm -hmm. Um, if you continue just writing short stories, there would be absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm just curious because very often, yeah. you know, people's ambitions expand um, yeah, yeah. as they move on. Yeah. Tika, it's been a, an enormous pleasure for me to speak to you today. I wonder if there's anything else you'd like to add to um, the conversation. Um, nothing, nothing comes to mind except... Except if I had to close with like, you know, a sort of word of advice for, you know, other other writers who, you know, may may actually may, like me, incorrectly classify themselves as amateurs. I think the the it's it's I think we can all reframe our writing as like once you're writing, you are a writer. That's you know, we can we can just have that 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 definition as as a as a broad base and like if you want to write and you are writing then you are a writer. And, um, but
but I would say, you know, if, if I had like one word of advice is that the metric of success, I think should be internally driven, you know, I think it should be goals that you have as a person and not necessarily the reaction from, you know, the external reaction. So not necessarily do you win the award or, or do you get shortlisted? I think it's, it's more like, is this story the best that you can make it? You know, is this better than what you've written before? And I think as long as we're all, you know, getting that improvement, then that success, that the, the, the writing project has been a success. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know. Those are wise words, but of course, before you can talk about, you know, shaping what you've got, mm. the very initial spark has to come from you. In other words, you have to have something to say. Mm. You strike me as someone with a great deal to say that is not yet being, being expressed. So I'm excited mm. to see what will come from you in the future. And I, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. I, I want to wish you enormous Good luck on the journey ahead, as as well as to congratulate you again on um, what is certainly a very significant achievement. And I hope our paths cross in the wider literary world, and I'm I'm sure they will. Yeah. Um, so I'll let you get on with your day, and I hope it's um, I hope it has some writing in it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Damon. This is a great chat. Thanks. A great, yeah, a great a great pleasure to chat to you. Bye, Bye. and see, see you again. Bye. -bye.